There are a lot of books out there that just sound really, really weird and funny on the surface. Like, especially self-published ones. Like, you can look through the self-published section on the Amazon store, or you can just, you know, dig through the bargain bin at used bookstores and stuff. But, like, whether you're talking self-published, professional published, there's a lot of books out there that just sound really weird and funny on the surface, you know? There are literal fan fictions that people publish, there's Drex that no publisher would touch, self-insert power fantasies, lazy attempts at cash grabs, there's a surprising amount of books that are basically just people trying to write anime, you know, etc. There, there's a lot of these. And there are so many that no one will ever discover, you know, they'll never have like any sort of following or anything, YouTubers will never talk about them and make fun of them, and a big reason for that is just that outside of the setup and a few bits scattered throughout maybe, they're just really boring. You know, they sound crazy and fun and over the top, but they're just not. You know, things like Evermore, which I reviewed a few months ago, you should check it out, or Empress Teresa, or The Fifth Sorceress, like, those are really great to read and review and talk about because there is just constant insanity in all of those. Like, they sound crazy because they are crazy. But then there's a lot of others that are unknown because there's just nothing to say about them. Or there's very little to say about them. You know, they sound crazy, and there's a few details throughout which are crazy, but outside of that, they're just really dull. You know, a lot of times, the author will take themselves too seriously to do anything silly on purpose, but they don't have enough imagination to really do anything crazy and weird and funny on accident, either. And, uh, you probably guessed by now, Leviathan is one of those. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. Also, yes, I'll get to the stuff in the title later. I swear it's not clickbait. This guy really does write propaganda for the Russian government. And that is a shame, because this book sounds really cool on the surface. You know, it sounds like it might be a cool, fun story, or at the very least, it would be something so stupid you can laugh at it. Like, I mentioned it on a live stream that I was on a little while ago, and the other people there agreed with me. They said, yeah, that sounds kind of cool on the surface, but... Then I explained a little more, and like it's just, it's mostly just boring. You know, it's based on Christian mythology. You know, it's about Noah, as in the guy from the story of the Great Flood. He, he built the ark because God talked to him and said, hey, I'm going to kill everybody except you and your family. Uh, and this is long before that, though. Like, this is hundreds of years before when he's a young man, and it just follows his young life living amongst you know, angels and Nephilim and dinosaurs. We'll, we'll get to the dinosaurs later, don't worry. Uh, on his journey to be the chosen one by God. You know, it starts off with him before he does all that. And like, how does he become that person that we know from the story in the Bible? Which sounds kind of cool. Also, people have gotten salty with me before because I refer to Christian mythology as Christian mythology. That's, that's what a religion is when you don't believe in it. You know, Christianity is just as real as Greek myth and Egyptian myth and Aztec myth and all those others. Like, they're, they're just as real. Like, just because people take it more seriously in the modern world that doesn't make it more real or any less mythological. This setup for a story, though, sounds really neat. You know, it is fertile ground for something different. There can be fun adventures. There can be a new look at popular myth. And it's, it's just not that. Like, not even close. Like, I know it's still early in the year, but Leviathan is a, probably going to be a very good contender for the worst book I read in 2023. Not, maybe not for the reasons you're thinking, but it's, it's horrible, don't get me wrong. And before anybody gets butt hurt, this book is not bad because it's Christian. I'm not bashing it for that reason, no, nor am I bashing the author for that reason. It's bad because it's bad. You know, Percy Jackson is about Greek mythology. I don't believe in Greek mythology, the Percy Jackson books are still really good. Likewise, Prince of Egypt is based on uh, the book of Exodus from the Bible. Again, that's not a true story, but it's a good movie. You know, it, it takes the original Bible story, expands on it, gives the characters some personality. Uh, we see the relationship between Ramses and Moses, which is fantastic. Uh, the animation and the soundtrack are great. Like, it's, it's not a real story. It's still a very, very good movie. Now, I'm preempting the inevitable hate because conservative Christians will tell you that dog shit tastes like candy if the dog claimed to love Jesus first. And if you don't believe me on that, like, just look up reviews of some crappy Christian movies online if you want proof of that. Like, for real. Just, just look through some of those, you realize, like, okay, these people don't actually care about the quality of the movie. They're just there to have their beliefs validated. 
somehow. Just like with a lot of crappy Christian movies that have come out lately, like, you know, the God's Not Dead movies, uh, this, this Leviathan is really not aimed at convincing anyone of their viewpoint, uh, nor is it even about representing the values of Christianity. It's just there for people to jerk themselves off about how they're better than everybody else. Which is kind of a shame, because some of these stories do have a lot of potential. You know, like, Christian stories could be good, but so many of them can't just be a good story that has Christian themes in it, or that is based on Christian stories, like again, Prince of Egypt, uh, but they just have to sacrifice everything at the altar of showing off that everyone who disagrees with them is stupid, ugly, evil, and hated by God. You know, it, it can't just be, hey, here's my beliefs and values uh, represented in this greater story about something else. It has to be, hey, here's something that's specifically about how I am better than you. Like, if you ever watch, again, the God's Not Dead uh, movie, the first one, uh, all the atheists are evil. And that's done completely at the expense of giving them any real motivation or character. So, like, they, they can't even be good villains, nor are they realistic people. They are just evil. Be why? Because those people disagree with the creators, therefore they are evil. Except Leviathan, despite being a Christian book, doesn't even have that. Like, like at least then I would be able to hate read it and point out all the crap in there that sucks about it. But I can't even do that. This book is empty. Like, oh my god, it is empty. It's not bad, because bad would be something. And it's not even boring. It is empty. Like, as far as plot goes, there's like six events that actually occur in this book. And it's like, oh, this copy's over 400 pages long. So that, there's not a lot going on here, even though it's somewhat long. The characters here, I, I don't even know if I could call them two-dimensional. Like, they are there to once in a blue moon spout religious dogma. Like, again, they, they don't even do that very much, but like, once in a blue moon it does happen. Uh, the characters are there to praise Noah for just being the best, and if they're villains, they're there to talk about how I am evil, mwahahahaha, and they usually don't have any real reason for being evil, they just, they just are. And mostly, though, it's not even that much. They just exist. Like, there are so many characters that are there, and they do nothing in the story, they have no identity, no personality, no nothing. They're, they just exist, and they're there. And there are dozens of them. This book was not written for entertainment. It doesn't seem like it was written to be wish fulfillment for the author. It doesn't even really seem like it's trying to push an ideology. And if it is trying to push an ideology, it's so weak that it's almost unnoticeable. And it's not even fun to, like, read and point and laugh at. Like, there's maybe three things in this book that are dumb enough to really amuse me. And there's exactly one moment in the entire book that made me laugh. And it, it was on the last page, too, so I had to go through a lot of crap to get there. And it wasn't, like, good-spirited laughing along with the book. It wasn't like it finally made a good joke or anything. Like, I mean, it was harsh and judgmental laughter. If the author was there when I read it, I would point in his face and laugh directly at him. This book is literally just telling the story of Noah's early life, but there's no new details, no new insights, no nothing. You know, how does he become the guy that God decides, okay, he's pure and free of sin, so he needs to build the Ark. I'm going to talk to him specifically. Like, how does he become that guy? I don't know. Like, why is he so f pure and free of sin? What made everyone else around him turn away from God? What sort of society came out of the expulsion from the Garden of Eden? How is faith in God affected by only being a few generations removed from Adam, you know, the first person who spoke, or the first man who spoke to God? All of these could have been interesting questions to ask, but we don't do that. Noah is just pure and amazing and good from the beginning just because. Not a single thing here is changed or even really expanded upon in any meaningful way from the Bible. It's just longer. And that, that's a shame. Like, why is that? You know, the source material is rich. You could do a lot with it. It does form a basic a basis for some decent fantasy. You know, the Bible has angels and monsters and demons and stuff. Like, you, you could have fun with that. But that's the thing, again, it's fantasy, and the author doesn't think that this is fantasy. He believes every word of it is literally true. Yeah, this is one of those books that's more of a look into the author's deranged mind than anything else, because, oh my god, this guy's a piece of work. So allow me to introduce R.M. Huffman. That's short for Richard Mark Huffman. Uh, this guy is a doctor, an anesthesiologist, 
who lives in Texas, and he's also a nutcase. He is a young Earth creationist, meaning he thinks the world is only a few thousand years old. For those of you unaware, I hate to burst your bubble, that's not true. That's what the Bible says, but it's not true. That was written by people who didn't understand the world around them and were trying to make sense of it. We know better now. Usually creationists will claim that scientists are all in on some massive conspiracy to do something. You know, like they, they made up the theory of evolution and everything around it and everything, well basically all science, is made up because, I don't know, reasons, but like they just claim that. I don't know if that's what Huffman believes, but many others do. I do know, however, that Huffman believes humans and dinosaurs lived side by side. Specifically, he thinks that they lived side by side, they used to be called dragons, they were hunted to extinction sometime in the Middle Ages, and then when they dug up their bones in the 19th century, they were renamed to dinosaurs in order to make people not believe in the Bible. This is a real thing. Like, I know some of you are probably having your minds blown and just going, wow, this is one crazy guy. It's not one crazy guy. There are plenty of other people who unfortunately believe this. According to the acknowledgments at the beginning of the book, Huffman literally believes we are all descended from Noah. Like, literally. He, he just thinks that. I'm not sure how he thinks that one family of white people created all of humanity. You know, like, again, this one family of white people, and now we have black people and Asian people and Indian people and, you know, everybody else. Not, not sure how that happened. And also, hey, Huffman, um, if you believe all of this literally happened, how is this fantasy? Like, you yourself have called this fantasy. Wouldn't it be historical fiction if that were the case? Because I'm, I'm sure at some, if I were to ask you, uh, to your face, you would say some of this is dramatized and not meant to be taken 100% literally, but you do believe that humans and angels and Nephilim lived side by side, and dinosaurs, like, <laughs> that's somehow the dumbest part, but you do literally believe that, so how is it fantasy and not historical fiction? Because your own publisher even labels it as fantasy. They say fiction, fantasy, action and adventure, fiction, fantasy, dragons and mythical creatures. Your own publisher's making fun of you, dude. And let me be clear, being Christian, or being religious, I should say, uh, does not make you dumb. Like, it means you're wrong, but it doesn't mean you're an idiot. You know, you can have one or two dumb beliefs while still being overall intelligent or an overall decent person. You know, like, as long as you're not a dick about it, I really don't care what your religious beliefs are. We can still be friends. However, being a creationist does make you dumb. Because in order to reach that point, you have to ignore well, basically the world around you, because you're just dismissing so many different fields of science with so much different evidence that shows the world is older than it is. You know, you have to ignore geology, biology, astronomy, archaeology, history, zoology, paleontology, and more. And this isn't like stuff you have to take on faith. You know, you can observe the things they talk about yourself and realize, oh, okay, yeah, the world's not 6,000 years old. Now, people are allowed to believe all this if they want. Like, it, again, it's really stupid, but they're allowed to think it. They're allowed to tell other people about it and try and convince them of it. But just like they are allowed to voice their beliefs, you know, I'm, I'm not going to try and stop them. Like, who, who am I to do that? But just like they're allowed to voice those beliefs, I'm allowed to make fun of them for it. You know, it, it goes both ways. You have, to, you have a constitutional right to be a dumbass. Huffman is also an anti-vaxxer because if you're going to be a dipshit, you may as well go ahead and get dipshit bingo. Like, I, I'm i really not joking when I say I fear for the safety of this man's patients. Like, again, not, not joking, not trying to be snarky in any way. Rejecting vaccines and evolution, I mean, at that point, you're just ignoring almost all the laws of biology. So I don't know how he could possibly do his job as a doctor well. Like, did, did he get his degree from Tijuana or some shit? Like, I... I don't know, but all I'm saying is, if you're ever getting surgery in Frisco, Texas, and your anesthesiologist is named Richard Mark Huffman, maybe request a different one. On top of that, there is his very extreme, very public, and very violent, in some cases, hate for the LGBT community, Muslims, Jews, people who are the wrong type of Christians, like, they, basically people who disagree with him in any way. Like, I straight up would not trust this guy to provide care to anyone. Like, if he found out a patient was gay or something, like, he literally believes gay people are possessed by demons, so I don't think that I could trust him to do... to give them proper care, you know? There's a common saying that you have to respect other people's beliefs, and no, you don't. 
you respect their right to have those beliefs, but you reserve the right to point and laugh at them when their beliefs are demonstrably stupid. You do need to acknowledge their beliefs, though. You know, r religious conservatives tend to be just completely unable to conceive of other people believing things differently than they believe. Like, they think that everyone agrees with them, but some of us pretend not to for some reason. You know, trying to gain some advantage or something. Like, that's why the atheist professor in God's Not Dead actually does believe in God. He just hates him because, I don't know, his mom died or whatever. That's a terrible movie. Like, people like Huffman and other extreme religious conservatives just lack any sort of imagination and they lack all any sort of empathy. Like, they straight up do not understand other people. And to add on top of the pile of why he's a shitty person, he also writes for Russia Today. Oh, sorry. RT. Yeah, totally different thing. They changed their name a couple of years ago, and I think RT doesn't even really stand for anything anymore. But yeah, it, it was formerly Russia Today. It's, it's literal Russian government propaganda. Like, anything that shows up there is there because Vladimir Putin approves of it. And Huffman has multiple articles on there, like multiple opinion pieces he's written. And some people will try and declare that just because it's run by the Russian government doesn't mean it's not, oh, it does, doesn't mean it's propaganda, it's just run by the Russian government. Or they'll try to say, oh, well, what about this other thing, and change the subject or something. It doesn't matter. R.M. Huffman has created propaganda for a brutal dictator. And if he wanted to get his thoughts out there, again, he's allowed to do that, but there are hundreds of other publications that he could have gone to and said, hey, can I write an opinion piece for you? and a lot of them would have taken him. Like, the fact that he decided to work with these guys, I mean, that just, that just says a lot. Also, I don't know if this is relevant, but this guy, oh my god, he is on Twitter all the time. Like, he tweets multiple times a day. However, around the time of the Russian invasion of Ukraine last February, he stopped for about three weeks, which as far as I can see, he hasn't done that very much before. And then he just started up again like nothing happened. And I, again, I don't know if that's relevant, but I felt the need to bring it up. <laughs> and it's just, I don't know. If, like, for most people, creating propaganda for a dictator would be, like, top of the list for why they're a scumbag. With this guy, I don't even know if it breaks the top ten. I mean that. Like, I have not read a book by somebody who's this much of a scumfuck since Steven Seagal. It, like, even on the bottomless pit of undiagnosed mental illness known as Twitter, this guy stands out. Like... Recently, he had ChatGPT write a book and then published it under a different name and declared himself a genius for doing so. Like, like he did that. Like, he's taking credit for ChatGPT writing something because he came up with the prompt. It's... I don't know. Like, in fact, he's constantly promoting his own work by referring to them as genius and original. Like, he has a couple of children's books that he's written as well, which he compares to Dr. Seuss. Like, he, he, he seems to think he's on level with Dr. Seuss. Like... Dude, they're selling yourself, and then there is reveling in your arrogance. And this is reveling in your arrogance. Here, real quick, let me check how many ratings Leviathan has on Goodreads. Ooh, 25, that, including mine. Hey, hey man, that, that's almost 26. I'm glad to see you've made a bestseller. I mean, I may be the first critic or publication of any note to talk about this book, but... I mean, hey, somebody's grandma bought it for them for Christmas, and they said, oh, thanks, grandma, and now, now it's going to sit unread on the shelf for three years and then given to Goodwill or thrown away. I mean, that's, that's kind of successful. Like I said earlier, he thinks that LGBT people are literally possessed by demons, which uh, demons aren't real, just to be clear. They're, they're not. I, I, I hate that I have to specify that, but they're not. Uh, he also continuously calls them all pedophiles. In fact, he calls basically everybody he disagrees with pedophiles, which, um, he, he also thinks that the Bible is the literal word of God and is not to be changed or interpreted any differently than he has interpreted it, but, I mean, Huffman, if that's the case, why does God condone pedophilia? Because it doesn't take galaxy brain to know that the Bible has some, uh, let's say, problematic elements in it. And there are passages like Numbers 31, 15 through 18, Judges 21, 20 through 23, and Exodus 21, 7 through 10, which all condone pedophilia. For no particular reason, here's a picture of a film projector. Now, obviously, I'm not saying that Christians are pedophiles. Like, that's not at all what I'm saying here. 
What I am saying is that if I met somebody who believes that literally everything in the Bible is good and true, including the parts about pedophilia, and they're constantly thinking about the abuse of children, and they're constantly talking about the abuse of children, and they're constantly accusing everyone they don't like of abusing children, I'm going to be giving that person some serious side-eye. Huffman also straight up threatens to burn down churches that disagree with him. Like, yeah, I'm, just, I'm not even making that up. That's that a thing he, that's a thing he's done. Or, sorry, he says they deserve to be burned down. Totally different. Like, he has constant posts about how he wants to create an independent city-state where everybody dresses traditionally in dirndls, which... Real dirndls looked nothing like that. They didn't have cleavage showing. That Historically, they were much, much more modest than that. So clearly, he just wants to post tits on Twitter. Like, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that, but... I... Like, that's what he does. And, like, another part of this is that he just wants to live in traditional buildings because nobody builds traditional buildings anymore. Huh. That's weird. As soon as I said that, my neighbor's dog started barking. This man literally... Again, I am not making any of this up. He literally asked Elon Musk to build cathedrals and included this picture in there. If that looks familiar, that's because it's Irithyll of the Boreal Valley from Dark Souls 3. This guy asked... This guy went in public and asked Elon Musk to make Dark Souls real. <laughs> oh, God. Although, probably my favorite part about this whole thing is that this guy has his own website, which, you know, that, that's fine. Like, you're a small indie author having a website to promote yourself, let your fans hear about news from you and everything. That does make sense. But his website is unfinished. Okay, so I, I'm recording this ahead of time because I'm just afraid he might change his website. But I swear to God, all of this is real. So, like, this this is his website, right? TheHuffmanLetters.com. And a, a small author having their own website, perfectly normal. It is a little weird that they have a login thing like you can apparently create accounts on there but whatever and then it's pretty normal stuff like home and about section a section where you can buy books and stuff and then when you go to the reviews and press page right like you'd think that's where they would put all the rave reviews of their books and everything but if you look it's just sample text it says i'm a review Click to edit me and add text that says something nice about you and your work share a bit of critical critical acclaim and spur some excitement for your latest project and then coming suit. And then just more. It's the exact same thing over and over again. Like, it, apparently he bought a template for this website, which, I mean, that's fine. Not everyone can be an expert in web design. But he, he bought this template, and then he didn't fill it out. Presumably because there aren't any reviews left. Or there aren't any reviews yet. But, like, just remove this page until you get some reviews, man. <laughs> what the fuck? And that's really weird that he wouldn't put any quotes on his website, because there are quotes on the book here. Like, on the back and inside a little bit. There are quotes from a couple of people talking about how awesome it is. Like, granted, they're not from anybody notable. Like, the closest thing to a notable author on here is Tim LaHaye, who is one of the authors of the Left Behind series. And other than that, it's like a bunch of unknown Christian authors. But, you know, still, you, you still could have used those. Like, <laughs> I don't know, I just... This man is a joke, okay? Like, he's an awful human being, but we should all remember that even though he's an awful human being, we, we just need to point and laugh at what a loser he is. It's nice that I can just come right out and call him out for being a twat, though. Like, I, I don't have to be polite or respectful in any way, and I, I haven't been able to do that with an author since Steven Seagal. But let's circle back to the book, and let's talk about how the author believes that the world this takes place in is literally true, and the story from the Bible of Noah and everybody is literally true. You know, it's not allegory or metaphor. Uh, it wasn't changed or mistranslated at any point in history. It, it's like, it's literally true. This is, like, from the very start, this is the kiss of death for a fantasy series. Like, just the absolute kiss of death. There is just no coming back from that. I don't think there's any salvaging it. Because imagine for a moment if J.R.R. Tolkien believed that Lord of the Rings was literally true while he was writing it. Like, like he was literally saying, no, no, Middle-earth is a real place, and Frodo and Gandalf were, like, real people. This is all true, guys. It all really happened. Like, 
If that was the case, he wouldn't be writing a world that he thought was interesting, or characters that he thought were fun to follow, or a story that was meant to evoke certain emotions in readers, because, you know, that's what stories are for. They're meant to evoke, you know, excitement, sorrow, fear, surprise, you know, etc. But that's not what Tolkien would be doing if he thought it was real. He would be writing fanfic about somebody that he worships, who, again, he thinks is a real person, uh, where that person he worships does awesome stuff. Except the stuff that he does really isn't that awesome unless it's filtered through the lens of already believing he's awesome. Like, it's circular nonsense, and that's basically what Noah is in this book. Like, all of Noah's accomplishments here are only really impressive if you already believe that Noah is an impressive individual. It does nothing to convince you of him being all that cool or impressive. Like, the author believes that Noah is the ultimate paragon of virtue, which means that he has to be the ultimate Mary Sue. Like, Noah cannot have flaws because his only real identity from the Bible is the, being the paragon of humanity. You know, like, him and his small family were, like, the only people that God decided not to kill for being sinners. And because Huffman believes this is literally true, he can't change or refute that. You know, if he was, like, not a Christian, or at least not a hardcore Christian, and he just took the story of Noah as inspiration, then he could change stuff about that and make it more interesting, but he, he can't do that. He, he can't refute it or anything. Like, he has religious reverence for the figure of Noah, and so he can never portray him as anything less than perfect. Hell, he, he can't even conceive of him being less than perfect. And that's, uh, that's just the kiss of death for your story. Like, it would be so much more interesting to see Noah as a flawed young man, and then we can watch him turn into the flawless patriarch who would build the Ark on the orders of God, like, that that could be a good story, and it wouldn't even really refute what's in the Bible, but that would involve asking questions, and religion is not to be questioned. You know, I, th I, think, I think that's why Greek myth, and even Norse myth, and Egyptian myth, to a lesser extent, uh, has more stories based on it in the modern world, and even stuff that is based on Christian myth tends to just take some basic facts about it and put it in a modern setting. You know, like Angel Fire, which I just read, that is based on Christian myth, but it's not like just retelling stories of the Bible or anything. Like, uh, But the reason that Greek myth is used so much and that that's moved to a modern setting is that Greek gods and heroes were flawed and that makes them interesting. And if you have original characters who are just interacting with like, you know, the Archangel Gabriel or whoever, then those original characters can be flawed and that makes them interesting. As for the actual events of this story, I mean, there's there's barely any here. Like, there's a couple excuses to show Noah be amazing, except he doesn't really do anything amazing. He, everyone just acts like he's doing amazing stuff. Like, it's, I, I don't know, it's hard to explain, but I think you'll see what I mean as we go on. What is the conflict? Uh, at first, Noah wants to save his hometown slash his family who lives there. Later on, it's, like, I'm kind of unsure what's even going on. Like, I, I, I've read the thing and I'm unsure. And then suddenly there's a big battle at the end. You know, like, it's not well put together at all. Like, I, I really wish I could say this book is the worst thing ever, but it's too empty to even do that. And, I don't know, that's, that's a very long intro. Let's just get started. Spoilers ahead. So we'll start with the prologue, which says it takes place 930 years after the creation of the world. So this is long after Adam and Eve have been kicked out of the Garden of Eden, and by now humans have spread all over the world. And we open on a man named Lamech, who is the father of Noah, if you're unfamiliar, uh, and he is riding a dinosaur. Lamech raced down the gritty road, his scarf pulled over his face to keep out the dust. His crested dragon's clawed feet tore up the ground in long, protruding strides. Millennia from now, the beast would be called a Hadrosaurid. The rider called him Grip, and he was fastest in the herd. Again, if you doubted me when I said that Huffman literally believes that humans rode dinosaurs, he just came right out and said it right there. Remember, in crappy books like this, the heroes and the narrator are only ever allowed to agree with what the author believes, and only the villains are ever allowed to criticize or question those beliefs. Crappy writers are crappy writers partially because they really don't understand or empathize with other people's point of view. You know, like, look at my videos or in anyone else's videos really on, like, The Way of the Shadow Wolves, or True Allegiance, or The Fifth Sorceress, or Trigger Warning, or, hell, the entire Onision trilogy. You know, good fantasy includes heroic, likable characters that the author may or may not agree with. 
you know, uh, Yasna from the Stormlight Archive is a very good example because she is an atheist and Brandon Sanderson, the author, is a Mormon. But in spite of that, Yasna is still intelligent and sympathetic and heroic. And uh, in the first book, The Way of Kings, like, there is a whole sequence where she explains to somebody why she's an atheist. And it's done very respectfully, very intelligently, and yeah, she makes a good point. And that's how you know that Brandon Sanderson actually took the time to understand other people's point of view and decided to write them respectfully because he, I don't think he hates atheists, at least he doesn't hate them for being atheists. Uh, or hell, in an old pr project that I worked on, like an old book I wrote a couple of years ago, uh, the protagonist of it was a committed monarchist. Like there, there was a whole revolution where they overthrew him and replaced him with a democratic government, uh, but the main character was fighting to put the king back on the throne, essentially. Like, the reason I did that was because I wanted to make a main character who I would disagree with ideologically and who I would probably hate if I personally met him, but I wanted to make him sympathetic. Whether or not I did a good job of that, I mean, that's up for other people to decide. Like, it's not a published book or anything, so you're not going to be able to read it, but, you know, the, the point is, I, that, I, that's what I was trying to do. And unfortunately, bad writers just don't get this, and so throughout the entire book, the entirety of Leviathan, only villains are allowed to say anything that Huffman finds objectionable at all. Anyways, back to Lamech on the dinosaur. Now, I think dinosaurs in fantasy is a cool idea, and I don't think that that idea has been explored nearly enough. Like, last year I read uh, The Dinosaur Lords, which was a really cool, fun series. You know, it was about dinosaurs, which are cool, and it was about knights, which are cool, and it just combined the two and it achieved new heights of awesomeness. Like, but the thing is, uh, there's a lot of detail about the dinosaurs, not just about them themselves, like how they behave and their biology and everything, but a lot of detail about how they're integrated into human society. You know, how do we use them in agriculture? How do they use them in warfare? Uh, some people use them as pets, you know, for companionship. Uh, some of them are wild and they make travel difficult. You know, like there are giant leopleurodons and such out in the ocean which can attack ships, or uh, there are stretches of forest with Allosaurus, Allosaurus, is Allosauruses or Allosaurus? I don't, I don't remember. But Allosaurus and T-Rexes that can attack people. Like, it's how are dinosaurs integrated into society? How do people live with them? How do people try to deal with them when they can't live with them, you know? And there is nothing like that in here. There's a few times that characters ride dinosaurs, and there's a battle at the end where one or two of them come back, but that's really it. And there, there's a bestiary at the end, which... Uh, gives like the names of the dinosaurs and uh, describes them a little bit like because they have different names in this than they did in real life but yeah there, there's nothing in the actual story itself that goes into any sort of detail about how they fit into this world so there's zero effort in that aspect of the world building and that continues to everything else you know the culture of this world the politics history flora and fauna nothing has any more detail beyond the absolute most surface level imaginable. Like, so the whole book just winds up feeling really lazy, but it also feels like it's trying too hard. So anyways, Lamech is a descendant of Adam, and I mean, I mean, I guess everyone is a descendant of Adam in this world, but whatever. Lamech is a, only a few generations removed from Adam, and he's going to witness his death, because Adam is over 900 years old now, and he's finally succumbing to old age, but and if that sounds weird, that is actually accurate to the Bible. Like, before the Great Flood, people did live a lot longer. So that's, you know, that, that's a thing. And there is a really long paragraph about the landscape he's riding through and how all the grapes there are used to make the best wine ever. And there, there's actually a lot of weird focus on wine in this book. Like, I, I don't know why. It doesn't seem like it's a metaphor or anything. There's just a lot of talk about wine. A dignified future awaited those grapes, destined to be pressed into the best wine in the region. Indeed, the wine's superiority was no longer considered to be a matter of taste, but a matter of fact, by the many who had enjoyed it. The wording of it is also weird. Like, it, it's trying to sound smarter than it really is, and that is the entire book, really. Like, ev every sentence of it is trying to sound smarter than it really is. So anyways, Lamech makes it to Adam, and then Adam apologizes for his sin, which got humanity thrown out of the Garden of Eden, which, remember, he and Eve both ate from tr fruit from the Tree of Knowledge, and then they were cast out because of it, and then he dies. And there's, like, a big funeral, and everyone is sad, etc. Now, the thing is, this is a fantasy book. 
it has a prologue that's pretty standard, so you would expect some of this to come back later, right? Like, some of these details to be important at some point in the story, and nope. Not, not at all. Nothing, nothing about that bit with Adam comes back in any way. Like, the, the only semi-almost important thing from the prologue comes after the bit with Adam, and I, I just, like, cut out the bit with Adam then, you know? Like, if it's not important, leave it out. Kill your darlings. So then it cuts to a woman named Nama, and this is still the prologue, remember? Uh, a woman named Nama, who is a descendant of Cain, who lives in a city called Enoch with other descendants of Cain. Enoch was a person, not a city. And later they mentioned the city was named after him, but that's kind of confusing, so I'm not sure why they would do it. I don't know. Anyways, some newcomers walk nearby, and Nama is really impressed with them. The tallest man, the one Nama had first noticed through the mists, gazed directly at her. She met his eyes. Their crystal, unearthly beauty caused butterflies to flutter in her chest, but the intensity, almost intimacy, in the way he looked at her made them race down to her legs. Had she been standing on dry land, her trembling knees might have failed her. Did that guy looking at her just make her come? You know, I know it's a meme for men to be bad at writing women. You know, like, there, there's that whole, oh, she breasted boobily across the room, but, like, that, that bit is impressively dumb. Like, I, I, I'm kind of at a loss for words for describing just how stupid that was. Now, I'm not saying that the only men who could have written a passage like that are men who have never pleasured a woman sexually, but I am going to say that if a man had never pleasured a woman sexually and he tried to write about one being pleasured sexually, he would write something very similar to that. So anyways, Nama talks to him, and his name is Samyaza, and he's a Grigori, which is a Watcher Angel. And that that's it. That's the end of the prologue. There was so much important info and foreshadowing contained here. I'm glad it exists. And I mean, like, literally that's just Nama and Samyaza's first meeting, and then at some other point they get married, and later on uh, she dies, and Samyaza is sad, but... I don't think we needed to see their first meeting in order to understand why he would be sad that his wife is de dead. Like, I feel like you can just have him go, oh, my wife is dead, and we, we generally understand and be at least a little sympathetic towards him. I really hate to say this, like, it, I feel like this is gonna burn my throat when I say it out loud, but the fifth sorceress did it better. Yeah, like, the, the prologue in the fifth sorceress was bad, but it did at least introduce important characters, and it did show how the world got into the state it's in during the main story. And this can't even do that, which is... Oh my goodness. So then we go to chapter 1, which is 206 years later, and this is after the birth of Noah, so he's around now. And our first introduction to Noah is that he is hunting a velociraptor, which these people call drakes, but according to the bestiary at the end, it is confirmed that drakes are indeed velociraptors. And we get this line, Water brought life, but for some creatures, water brought death. This book is just trying so hard to sound epic and poetic, but it just... It sounds like a middle schooler who just read Lord of the Rings. I swear to God. And I guess maybe that's meant to be foreshadowing for the Great Flood, but that doesn't even happen in this book. So, <laughs> what is the point? So anyways, Noah kills the raptor with his dad, Lamek, and his grandfather, Methuselah, and he goes home to his girlfriend slash cousin, who is named M. Zara, but everyone just calls her Zara for short. It's honestly kind of wild how Noah, like the biblical patriarch, fighting a velociraptor can be so boring, but somehow it, this book manages to do that. And when we're introduced to Zara, her description is very odd. A young woman approached Noah, walking with a light bounce to her step. Her bright eyes and pretty smile complemented the lovely figure of a woman exiting gracefully from the last stages of girlhood. She was, Noah thought, the most beautiful creature he had ever seen. Um, I exactly how old is Zara? Because exiting from girlhood could mean a lot of things, and in fact has meant a lot of different things in different cultures over the years. Like, she, she could be like... 13 or 19? Like, for, for my own sanity, I'm going to assume she's around 17 to 19, but egad. So anyways, they all have a feast, 
for whatever reason. I don't think they're celebrating anything. They just, they just have a feast, and it's great. And the thing is, we learn that they're in Eden right now. But Noah also says this must have been what life was like in the Garden of Eden. But the whole point of that story is that humanity was cast out of the Garden of Eden and can never come back. Like, is, is the Garden just part of Eden? Like, is, is there a fenced-off area <laughs> two miles down the road that they can't go into? I, I genuinely don't understand, but you should specify because it makes this throughout this book it sounds like these people still live in the Garden of Eden. Some people in Noah's family talk about how he is the subject of a prophecy. We don't actually get a lot of detail about what that prophecy is, they just say he is the subject of it, because we need to be informed of how special the protagonist is, that way we know we're supposed to Im be impressed by him every, every time he does anything. Like I said, we don't know what the prophecy says, they never show it in this book. Vague prophecies that say whatever the plot demands. That is such an excellent writing tool and not at all amateurish, I am so glad that it's here. So somebody steals a bull from Methuselah's herd, and Noah goes looking for it. He goes to the home of a man named Elibru, who is a nearby, I, I don't know, aristocrat is the best word I can think of for it. Like, like he's just a dude who lives in a manor and has a bunch of farmland around which he owns, and he has a whole bunch of servants who toil the fields and everything for him. I'm not sure where all these servants came from. I'm not sure why they work for him. I, I, like, do the Edenites use money? And if, if, he's, if they do, if he's paying them for this, then where does his money come from? I, I don't understand. So Elibru is a big meanie head. He says to Noah that he doesn't know where the bull is, but he won't help him, even if he did know where it was. Why is he like this? Why, why is he so rude to Noah? I don't know, but we need to be told that he's a big mean poopy head, that way we don't like him. And then on his way home, Noah is crossing a river, and he is nearly killed by a leviathan that shows up. Like, yeah, it turns out this thing appeared recently, it ate the guy who stole the bull, uh, so that's why they weren't able to find him, Noah just finds his body. And it is a sarcosuchus? Sarcosuchus? Some, something along those lines, I'm not totally sure how to pronounce it. Uh, it looks like this, though. It, basically a gigantic crocodile. They, they did exist in the real world. They were huge, like 30 feet long and they were kind of like dragons, and especially this one, because this one in the book does breathe fire. And at this point, I almost got excited because, hey, something is happening. So Noah tells everybody that, hey, there's a Leviathan in the river. We should stay away from that. And then Elibru takes a bunch of men-at-arms, which apparently he just has a bunch of soldiers at his command that he can take to go hunt this thing, but okay, whatever. Uh, and he takes them and tries to kill the Leviathan and they fail, and most of them die horribly. Which, th this sequence was kinda neat. You know, it, like, it's nice to see how powerful this thing is. Like, it has impenetrable scales that are immune to their spears and arrows and everything. It breathes fire, it's really fast, it's crazy strong. Like, you can see why this thing is such a threat, and that that's it, though. Like, it's, it's kind of neat. It, it doesn't really go above that. And this is... I think this is meant to be Elibru's comeuppance, but it's a pretty weak one because he lives and then he runs back to Noah and the rest of his family and tells them what happened. And while they're all discussing what's going on and what they should do, Elibru suggests that maybe they should just leave sacrifices for the Leviathan, and while doing so he refers to it as the new god of the river, and Lamek assaults him for that because there's only one god, and apparently it is completely reasonable to physically attack somebody for disagreeing with you on the subject of religion. I wonder if that reflects any of the author's real views. Now, what was it that made Elibru turn away from God? Do it, it doesn't matter, I guess. He's just bad because he, he's just bad. You know, same with everyone who turns away from God, or everyone who isn't the exact same brand of Christian as the author and the main characters. Like, every, they're all just bad because. This was an opportunity to have some interesting villains, you know? Like, villains who turned away from God, either for selfish reasons, or just because they lost their faith, or whatever, and you could do something with that, it would give them at least a little personality, and maybe some of them could be redeemed, but 
I guess that's not really the point of this story. You know, the point isn't to be a good story with interesting characters. The point is to let the audience know that the heroes are morally pure. And you can't let them know that they're morally pure by having them do anything good. No, silly. You just have to contrast them with the villains, who are bad. They need access to the river, though, you know, to water their animals, and they're also afraid the Leviathan will eventually, like, leave that area and start wandering and hunting their herds and hunting people. So they send Noah to Kenan to ask for advice. And Kenan is an ancestor who lives in Eden, but he lives pretty far away, off in his own corner. And Noah brings him some wine as a gift. But while Noah and Kenan are talking, Kenan monologues about his life for a couple of pages, you know. He married his sister, uh, because apparently that's just a thing that happened. In, like, in this world, everyone is extremely inbred. Like, not it's not just Noah being involved with his cousin, who he is now betrothed to marry. It's just ev everyone's marrying their siblings or their uncles or stuff. A anyways, he married his sister. They travel... He traveled very far and wide. He protected people from bandits. He fought demon sorcerers. Like, he, like, he did a lot of cool stuff, and now he's just retired and is enjoying the last years of his life in Eden, near his family. Honestly, Kenan's backstory sounds like it would be a way better book than what we got here. So he tells Noah to go to Enoch, the city of Enoch, not the person, remember. There's two different things, kind of confusing, but they're two different things. Uh, and to seek the help of the Grigori, who remember the, the Watcher Angels. This could have happened a lot quicker, but whatever. It that's what he tells him what to do. So then the next chapter we cut to Samyaza and Nama for a chapter, and she dies in childbirth, and he is sad, and that is it. That is that is the entire chapter. That's all it is for. And then Noah walks to Enoch from Eden, and that's it for several chapters. Yeah, there's not a whole lot that really happens on the journey. Like, he talks to some people. At one point he gets all his stuff stolen by a Nephilim, and you would think, like, okay, that'll cause him real problems down the line, or... He'll have to do a detour to go and get his stuff back or something, but no, he just gets tricked, and then this guy steals all his stuff, and then Noah goes, hmm, what an asshole, and then he keeps walking, and it doesn't cause him any problems. Like, there's no conflict at all in this part of the story, which is so stupid. Like, the point of a journey, whether that's like a literal physical journey to a place or an internal journey or whatever, is for the characters to have a goal and for them to face obstacles on the way to achieving that goal. Like, the point of a journey is for them to face hardships. And we're over a hundred pages in, and Noah has faced no hardships. So he arrives at the city of Enoch, and he uh, he's very impressed. You know, there are Nephilim, which in this are... They're, they're half-human, half-angels, and in the lore of the Bible, that just makes them basically giant humans. So in this, they're like eight, nine, ten feet tall, and other than that, they're basically just people. Uh, and then there's like foreigners, people from a bunch of different cultures, there are huge walls surrounding the city, canals, markets, you know, just stuff that he's seen before, or stuff that he's never seen before and he's very impressed by. But he has to mention, okay, I'm not, I'm not actually impressed, because the hero cannot display relatable traits like awe or feeling like he's in over his head. Just, nope, just total calm, stoicism all the time, never feeling anything except for his apparent love for Zara, because it's not manly to feel things, I guess. Now, keep in mind, it only took him a few days to walk from Eden to Enoch. Like, th this is all only a few days walk from his home, yet travel between the two places is so rare that people from Eden and Enoch know basically nothing about one another, which makes zero sense. Like, people wander. People go around and trade with each other and stuff, and especially in this book, it's mentioned humanity has covered the entire Earth in only a little over a thousand years, so clearly the people in this story do explore and trade with others and wander around, and how have they not run into each other before this? Or how have they rarely ran into each other before this? I, I don't understand. But most importantly, how the fuck can a city this big exist in this world? Like, it's mentioned twice in the book that half a million people live in Enoch, and that is just ludicrous. The, the idea that there's enough people to do that is ludicrous. Because to have just one city, even if it was just one city that big, but then they also have a bunch of like foreign lands with their own kingdoms and everything, you would need a gigantic human population. Because before modern technology, only a tiny percentage of people could be urban dwellers. You know, it just, we needed a lot more people producing food. It was hard to transport and refrigerate it. You know, it's just 
only a few or only a small percentage of people could do that. And so I thought about this probably more than I should have, and I did some research, and the first city in the real world to reach half a million people was Alexandria, Egypt, around 200 BCE, right? And at that time, the world's population was 150 million people. So in this world, where, remember, everybody's descended from Adam and Eve, there are only two humans, apparently, uh, and it's only been around 1,100 years since they left the garden and started having children, and according to the exponential growth function, uh, that is technically possible to go from two people to 150 million at a growth of 1.66% per year, which almost makes sense if you don't actually understand math. Like, while doing research, I saw people mentioning that, oh yeah, no, we, we can all be descended from Adam and Eve because exponential growth function, and they, they like used math to try and uh, justify it, but the thing is, in order for this to work, every woman would need to have a kid every year, forever. Like, starting from the year of her birth, by the way, which is also impossible. Infants can't have children. Uh, but, you, again, you need to have one every year for centuries, because people lived a lot longer, and no one could ever die. Like, there's so many assumptions here that it's useless as a model. Like, in order to believe that this part of the Bible is true, you would have to believe that the part where everybody lived for hundreds of years before the flood, but they didn't do it now. Like, like it was a really cool trick, but we can't show you now. Like, you would need to believe that part in order to believe this other part. So it's basically saying this part of the Bible is true because this other part of the Bible says so. Like, it's it's circular, circular, lo circular logic. And even in the book, the idea that no one could ever die is just ridiculous because people die. We see a bunch of them die. It literally started with Adam dying. <laughs> like, not only from old age, but people die in wars and stuff. Like, I just, it's, it's stupid. It, it really is stupid. Like, maybe you could justify this because, you know, it's a weird fantasy world, but no attempt is made. There's a genealogy at the end of the book, which only shows ten generations of people, like since Adam and Eve. There's only ten generations, and each of those generations only has a few kids. So, Clearly, they're not all going out and ha having hundreds of spawn, you know, unless Adam and Eve popped out 300 more off-screen that, that we didn't mention. <laughs> like, how does that even work? And obviously, the sheer amount of inbreeding here would cause serious problems, but we're pretending that's not a big deal. Like, again, according to the Bible, marrying your siblings was perfectly fine up until Moses came along, which was hundreds of years after this, so, you know. That, that's a thing. And even if they could create that many people, how would all the different hair colors and skin tones and heights and eye colors and etc., how would all of that come about? You know, you know, because people, if they're all from the same family, they'd be, and are severely inbred, they would all look pretty similar to one another. You know, they would make the McPoyles look like Aryan Ubermenschen. The McPoyle bloodline's been pure and clean for a thousand years. It means we haven't bred outside the bloodline. For a thousand years? Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. If, if you cite mutations and say, oh, well, okay, so, some of them mutated, so that's why there's, like, you know, occasional blonde hair or red hair or something. And if you acknowledge that entire populations can become different if they're descended by, from people who have mutations, then Congratulations, you have accepted the theory of evolution into your heart. And I know I'm going on about this for a while, but, like, if this was fantasy, it, like, if the idea that two people could create this many people in such a short amount of time so that we could have this gigantic city and other kingdoms spread throughout the world, if this was a fantasy world, I'd probably move past it. It's not fantasy, though. The guy who wrote it thinks it's real. It's the ramblings of a deranged dipshit. So Noah arrives in the city, he asks the people who run the city for help, including Grigori, humans, Nephilim, and they talk around it for a while, and then they invite him to stay the night. And he spends time with Jet and Gileon, characters who do nothing at this stage. Or, okay, Gil Gileon does one or two things later on in the story, so, you know, he contributes a little bit. Uh, but they neither of them say anything except praises for how awesome Glorion is, and Glorion is their father. He's, he's a Nephilim. Like I said, there are dozens of named characters in here. There's even like a several page long guide at the start, and none of them have any personality, like at all. Like, uh, there are one or two villains that are kind of cartoonishly evil, but that's about it. And 
even the ones that do have personality are not really memorable. Like, most of the characters here could have either been cut out entirely or just been rolled into another one, so we had less names to try and keep track of. But, yeah, there's a lot of characters here. So if I, like, just bring up a name out of nowhere and you think, did he mention them earlier? I probably didn't, and the book probably didn't either. But you don't really need to know much about them. Just, like, a person came in, did something, or was involved in some way, and then left. That's all you need to know. So Glorion, like I said, is a Nephilim. Specifically, he is the son of Samyaza, and as a Nephilim, he's a giant human. He doesn't have any powers or anything beyond that. Anyways, they eat dinner, and of course, they drink wine with their dinner. Now, while they're talking, Glorion mentions that people follow a lot of different religions. And I just wonder how and why. You know, like, if we're all descended from the same two people, and those two people, like, personally met God, and they all carry the stories with them, through the generations, like, hey, granddad met God, great granddad met God, and like, there's no other gods or anything that are coming in and telling people different stories, then where did all these other mythologies come from? You know, like, this isn't like the real world where we have a whole bunch of different mythologies competing and trying to tell you, hey, look, we're real, and you just choose one. This is, you only have one, and if your grandpa met God, it's probably a lot easier to believe in him. I guess Huffman thinks that people forget things if they're not constantly beaten over the head with them. So it turns out that no one has ever killed a Leviathan before. Like, ever. Like, Glorion is familiar with Leviathans, he's seen them before, but he says, hey, uh, no one's ever killed one, so good luck. But, in spite of that, where you'd think, okay, they're gonna refuse to help him and Noah's gonna have to convince them somehow, that, that doesn't happen. They just, some Nephilim, including Glorion and Gileon and several others, they agree to go help Noah kill the Leviathan and save Eden. Why do they go with him? It, like, does he offer them anything in return? Does he appeal to their better nature or something? Like, no, they just, they just go with him. They feel like it. That's all. So we are over one quarter of the way through this book, and no conflict has happened other than Noah wanting the Leviathan gone. Like, that is it. Think about it. The sequence of events in this book so far are, we watch Adam die, Noah talks about how awesome life is, the Leviathan appears, they try to kill it, they can't kill it, Noah walks to the city, again, without running into any sort of trouble, and then he convinces the Nephilim to help, again, without trouble. There, there is no conflict here. A story is not just things happening. It's characters trying to reach a goal and struggling on the way to that goal. Without that, there is no point. The king died and then the queen died is not a story. The king died and then the queen died of grief is a story because that implies there's conflict. Hey, here's another problem. If everyone in Enoch is a descendant of Cain, or at least most of them are, where did Cain's wife come from? According to the genealogy here, he married someone named Awan, who was his sister, who was also a child of Adam and Eve, and that is the often accepted folklore, but the Bible does not say where Awan, Awan came from. She doesn't say who she is, or that she's a sister, or anything like that. It just says that she's his wife. Where did she come from then? That, like, this isn't canon. The idea that he married Awan is not canon. So Noah and the others grab some equipment and they walk back to Eden, and while they're walking back, everyone makes sure to suck Noah's dick some more. Interesting, said Hoduin. My impression of Noah was much different. I would say that never a more spiritual man have I met. He seems in tune somehow with the vibrations of the cosmos. In fact, I hope to coax him to return to en Enoch and study with me. I feel as if the floodgates of the heavens might open to us to reveal their secrets. Dude, you barely know Noah. He's He has done nothing to warrant this. Like, what, what personality does he even have? Like, he's loyal to his hometown, I guess? He's... brave? Like, I guess the story treats him as brave for going to Enoch by himself, but I mean, he just walked for a few days and didn't face any danger. So how brave is that, really? So they arrive in Eden, again, they don't run into any trouble at all along the way, and Noah is happy to see Zara again, and Glorion introduces himself. I gathered, Glorion said, bowing and smiling broadly. I recognize in you both the passion I share with my own wife. I am very pleased to meet you. This dialogue is not robotic, but it's not human either. It, it is unsettling. Like, if I was walking down the street by myself at night and I ran into someone and they started talking to me the way that the characters in this book talk, 
I would run away like Usain Bolt. It's like it's like a lizard person trying to emulate human speech. It's not correct. Do you understand the li English language? So they drink some more wine and they prepare to kill the Leviathan. So Noah has them just dig a big pit and put sharp stakes in it so that they can lure the creature in and then it'll fall in, impale itself, and it'll die. That's not a bad plan, but it also... Everyone treats him like a genius for coming up with it. Like, how... How, how difficult could that plan really be to come up with? It, it seems pretty basic to me. Finally, they lure in the Leviathan and they start fighting it. And I'll be honest, this sequence is kind of cool. Like, there is some vivid imagery. Characters keep dying, so it does feel kind of tense. Like, we finally get to see the heroes be competent at something. You know, they're fighting this thing. Noah doesn't really fight it, but, you know, the other heroes do fight it. And, like, you can tell that Huffman had fun writing this part, and if it hadn't taken 160 frickin' pages to get here, it would have been a great ending to the first act of the story. There is still plenty of dumb stuff here, though. Like I said, they... Noah doesn't really do anything. And then they get the Leviathan to the pit, and it falls in, but it only gets minor injuries, so they just decide, okay, let's bury it alive, and they start dumping dirt on top of it. Uh, but it escapes, and it kills some more people. And then Noah thinks back to a conversation he had where he asked one of the Nephilim about how the Leviathan makes fire. And brief aside, I know that the singular form of Nephilim is Nephil or Nephil, and this book does use Nephil, but it feels weird to me, and so I'm just gonna say Nephilim, and I don't care if it's grammatically incorrect because Nephilim aren't fucking real. But anyways, Noah asked him how the Leviathan makes fire, and it turns out it has these chambers in its head which have uh, separate chemicals in them, and individually they're fine, but when they mix, they create fire. And Noah realizes that if he can make it mix while it's still inside the Leviathan, then it'll burn from the inside. So what's his brilliant plan to make this happen? He tells Glorion to smash its head with an axe. So his brilliant plan to kill the Leviathan is smash its head open. And we're supposed to be impressed by this. Like, this is... Yeah, no, and nobody else could have thought of that. Look, if you want to have him do something that's kind of impressive, or at least observant, have him notice a loose scale on its belly and just say, hey, there's its weak point, go for that. Or have him trick it into eating something poisoned. Or, hell, even luring it into the pit and stabbing it with a bunch of steaks was a better plan than this. Uh, so anyways, Glorion breaks its head open and it dies. Like, it, the chemicals mix, it burns from the inside. But again, he broke its head open even if it hadn't burned from the inside, that probably would have killed it. Noah, again, did next to nothing here, but he's treated like he did the lion's share of the work. And everybody is constantly patting him on the back and saying, Noah, you're so great! Like, I, I don't get it. Like, if the main character is supposed to be the coolest, best, most pure guy ever, wouldn't you want to show him being good at something once in a while? You know? Wouldn't, wouldn't you want to have him, like, pick up Glorion's axe because Glorion is injured and then he delivers the final blow himself, at least? Like, at least that would be kind of impressive. Like, that, it's weird for Noah to be such a gigantic Mary Sue when he doesn't even really do anything that impressive. Normally, when a character is a Mary Sue, they get to do a bunch of cool stuff, and everyone is super impressed and uh, in awe of them, but Noah doesn't even get that. But other than that ending and a few odd lines scattered throughout, this sequence really doesn't do anything phenomenally bad. So, you know, it, it's better than the rest of the book, at least. So while they are resting and celebrating the fact that they killed the Leviathan, uh, and this, this whole celebration goes on for more than 20 pages, by the way, uh, Glorion requests that someone come to Enoch as emissaries. You know, because they can be emissaries between the two places and, you know, form a connection between Eden and Enoch. Like, again, these places are right next to each other. Like, there should be a lot more contact already. I'm also not sure how there can be emissaries or ambassadors if Eden doesn't have any sort of government. You know, they don't, they don't have a king or a ruling council or anything. They just have a bunch of families who live around there, and each family seems to be a loose collective. I mean, granted, they're, they're all one family, really, so maybe they all just listen to the oldest one who cares enough to give orders. And if they don't have an army or anything, I'm not sure why Enoch didn't just conquer them earlier, but okay, sure. So Noah and Methuselah and some others all agree to go to Enoch uh, with no prompting. So this is the start of the main story. Like, the Leviathan and all that was just the inciting incident, and it comes more than 200 pages in. So we're, we're nearly halfway through the book, and the story has started. 
Awesome. So we get a chapter with Samyaza, remember, the leader of the evil Grigori, uh, Lilith, and Azazel. And again, there's so many characters here that just have very little definition and barely appear, but we're just expected to remember them and to care about them in some way. Like, do I even need to explain who these people are if they do nothing and have no definable identity? Like, I, I don't think so. Anyways, Azazel is a Grigori, and he kills a bird, so that's how we know that he's evil. And... Noah and company arrive, they get a tour of the city, and they hear about how the council apparently has very little to do, like the ruling council. R running a city requires a lot of work, but sure, okay. Now Methuselah at one point brags about how in Eden everyone is judged by his actions instead of his ancestry. Like, n yeah, no fucking shit, dude, you all have the same ancestry. Remember your inbred? You have, the, you have a constitutional right to be a dumbass! So the Grigori come along and demand that the Edenites be removed, but the council refuses. And Samyaza sees Zara, remember Noah's uh, betrothed, his fiancée, and decides he wants to marry her. And then there is this really weird scene between Azazel and Lilith. The Grigori's eyes snapped open. In one breath, he was out of the water, standing in front of her. Lilith shuddered, still in awe of his perfect form after all these years. She tilted her head to meet his eyes. First, I cannot find Glorion, she said, and then you disappear. What? He kissed her violently, leaving a spot of li blood on her lip. She licked it off, shuddered again. Uh, uh, uh okay. So Samyaza mopes around for a bit in the room he dedicated to Nama, which, remember, that was his ex-wife who died in childbirth. <laughs> like, it's very easy to forget, because so many characters here just have nothing to define them, but that, that was her. Uh, and his room is filled with tons of sculptures and paintings of her that he had made. Like, it's just, there's, there's dozens of paintings and busts and stuff, which... That's a strange detail, and it is kind of funny. Like, it did amuse me a little bit, but it's not focused on that much, so I don't really have anything else to say about it. The villains all have a cryptic discussion about how their evil plan is coming to fruition, and like, why is this a thing in bad books? You know, just the villains talking about their evil plans in very vague terms, like, they know the audience is listening in and they don't want to give away the surprise yet. Like, I either do it or don't, you know? Give, sus give specifics or don't have them talk about it at all. And I swear I'm not skipping anything important here. This whole book is just like brief flashes of characters we're supposed to care about and then moving to different flash of characters we're supposed to care about. It's like a slideshow. So back to Noah and his family in their new home. Uh, his brother asks Noah where their mom and dad are Noah says they retired for the night, which is implying that they're having sex, and his brother goes, Ew, I didn't want to know about that. And I, th I think this part was meant as a joke, but it's, it's really forced? Like, no, no one talks like that, you know? They, they would just say, where's mom and dad? Oh, they went to bed. Like, e even if he knew that they were having sex, why would he bring that up? Like, even if he didn't think it was gross to talk about or anything, there's no need to mention it, so why? Wouldn't that be kind of private? I just, I don't know, the characters in this book are all so weird, but they're not weird in a way that gives any of them personality, because they're not consistently weird. So we just wind up with odd moments and odd lines like that, which aren't even fun to laugh at. So Glorion asks Noah why he believes in his god and not the others, and great. That's awesome. Is this going to be an intelligent discussion on faith and how it works and how it affects people's lives? Why should I believe your tales? He had asked Noah one evening as they had made camp in the wilds of Nod. What raises its truth above all other accounts one might hear in any sorcerer's college? Why not the light of the Larue or the infinite turtle? Do not their adherents cling just as strongly to their beliefs? Noah had taken the question seriously. I suppose, he had said, it comes down to trust. We believe the account of the heavens and earth because it was written down by the one who was by the very one who was there. Okay, so that's another part where he's just saying the Bible is real because the Bible says that the Bible is real. Like, it's just, it's just so circular, man. It's frustrating because you could have had Noah have a crisis of faith or something before finding God again. You know, he could go out into the world and see all these people with different religions and realize that they hold to their beliefs just as strongly as he holds to his and then he starts questioning things and then later on he would find faith in God again. You know, like, Signs did something kind of like that, and that's a great movie, but we can't have that, of course, because that might make Dear Mary Sue look like he has a flaw. Like, this passage is just saying everyone thinks their religion is true, but I'm actually correct and everyone else is wrong. Like, yeah, 
Dude, everyone thinks their religion is true. That's why you keep murdering each other. Like, this is what I mean when I say bad writers just don't understand anyone else's belief beliefs. They believe what they believe without any real reason, so they think everyone else believes what they believe without any real reason. You know? Writing, before anything else, before you start talking about prose, characters, whatever, writing requires understanding what you're talking about. Or what you're writing about, I should say. So some assassins pop up and attack, and Noah escapes, a couple of them escape, but everyone else is killed or captured, including Glorion. Glorion is killed, which... I mean, he wasn't great, but I didn't actively hate him, so I suppose there's something resembling sympathy that almost arises in my chest when I hear that. And this sequence lasts a while. I'm really not leaving anything interesting out. Like, the bad guys just want them dead, and apparently they have a bunch of assassins to kill them with. Like, they, they just came up out of nowhere. The assassins are referred to as the Nameless, which is an oxymoron because that is a name, you idiots, you simpletons, you absolute fucking donkeys. And you might be wondering, how does Noah escape? Well, he escapes through a secret passage, because of course, it's it's a fantasy novel, the, the hero needs to either get in or get out of a fortress slash castle slash palace, so of course there's a secret passage, you know? Like, we don't even need to explain why it's there, or justify why it's there, just there is a secret passage, and we all are supposed to go along with it. So he goes to this giant hidden underground library, there are some friendly people there who are just called the scribes, and their names aren't important because they barely exist, you know, they, they show up here to help him once, and they give a little bit of exposition, and then they leave the story, or sorry, they, they don't completely leave the story just beyond that. They also suck Noah's dick for a little while. As a group, we scribes hide in our burrows, but as individuals we have resources. What we lack is a leader, someone who can take the mantle of the prophet Enoch and free the city, our people, from the grip of the angels. That leader must be you, Noah. You people don't know this man! He just popped up the other day. What has he done that's impressed you? Look, do not make your main characters Mary Sue's, but if you're going to, at least have them do something worth being impressed by so that you can justify everyone being impressed by them. Now, Noah did escape, but the Grigori want everyone to believe he's killed, so they bring his father and grandfather to a corpse that Azazel made up to, Azazel made up to look like Noah. Like, he, he doesn't use magic or anything, he just puts some makeup on a dead body and it fools Noah's family, like his own father and grandfather think it's him, and they're very upset. Which, that's stretching disbelief a little bit. Here's a better idea. If they wanted to make them all believe that Noah was dead and they used a fake body or something, they could just use magic to do it, or if they didn't have access to that, then they could just kill someone who kind of looked like Noah, and then smash up his face a little bit to cover up any differences, and then put him in Noah's clothes, and then it would be more believable why his own family would not recognize that that wasn't him. Just, just an idea, you know? So the bad guys celebrate some more, and they drink wine while they're celebrating. Uh, Samyaza tries to woo Zara, since now she thinks her fiancé is dead. And he acts pretty nice to her. You know, she, like, she is talking to him and says, Hey, why did Adam hate you so much? What did you do? And he basically says that, Well, Adam and I both tried to please God, but we tried to do it in different ways. And he actually compares it to the story of Cain and Abel. And he basically says, like, Well... Sometimes when one is pious, their piety turns to anger. Or when one is envious, their piety turns to anger. You know, and... Okay, I, I kind of like this scene. It makes Samyaza look kind of smart and manipulative, and then Zara kisses him, and I guess they're just, they're just a thing now. So Glorion's son, Gileon, remember I mentioned him earlier, he was at the fight with the Leviathan. You, you don't remember? Well, t too bad. Uh, he finds a member of the city guard who knows about the evil conspiracy that killed his father and faked Noah's death. And the guard is drinking wine, obviously, while they're talking to him. And he tells them all of this because they mixed in a truth-telling serum in his wine. And truth-telling serum was no not mentioned at all before this. It does not come back up after this. It's just a thing that apparently exists in the story, and we are supposed to accept that. Okay. So Gileon tells the council about this, and then the council summons Azaziel and Samyaza, and they're like, We're very mad at you! Like, they, they can't do anything, but, oh, they're mad. They, they, they're they not happy. They don't like you. 
and they they realize Noah is alive and Zara hears that he's alive. And there is this weird line. The den of the manor was a male's territory. Trophies from the hunt adorned the walls, as well as a dozen or so tastefully done paintings of nudes. Paintings of nudes, was that was that just a weird word choice or a typo? Or both? You could have said paintings of nude figures, that 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 would have worked. You know, you you're just completely, completely have no idea of the English language. Not... Now Noah and his brother are still hiding in the library, and his brother asks him, like, hey, we need to make up our minds. Are we gonna go back to Enoch or are we gonna go back home to Eden? And Noah just says he'll put his trust in God and like, that's not answering the question. You know, God's not gonna just come down and say, hey, here's what you should do. Like, he might send you a sign, but he's not just gonna tell you. Like, so somebody even calls Noah out, and he's, he tells him that trusting God sounds like it's just an excuse for not doing anything. Which, that's a good point, but it never comes back up, you know? Like, it could be a flaw that Noah has that he would have to work to get over, you know? like. He could just be walking around and saying, that's okay, God will take care of it, and never take any initiative and never try and do anything himself. And then r later on realize, oh, okay, God just provides me with the opportunities I need to succeed, but I still have to do it myself. But again, we can't have Noah have any flaws, even if he develops out of them. So a bunch of people who hate the Grigori show up and ask them for help. Like, they want to start a rebellion, and they decide that Noah should lead them in this rebellion against the angels, and he agrees. And, and keep in mind, this rebellion includes, like, both humans and Nephilim, who just don't like the Grigori being in charge. So, like, l literally, an army just materialized completely out of nowhere, and then just fell in his lap? Like, th there's nothing satisfying about this. Like, he didn't have to do any th work to gain it, so th th this moment is unearned, and thus it rings extremely hollow, you know? Like, if Noah had had to travel around, find allies, and, like, agitate for change, like, you know, go to villages and say, like, hey, you don't like the Grigori being in charge, me neither, fight with me and we'll get rid of them, and, like, convince people, then that would be neat. It would also make for a much better second act to the story, because this, this book doesn't really have a first act, or have a second act, you know? We have the first act, which is everything up until the Leviathan fight, and that's almost half the book. Uh, and then there's Noah going to Enoch immediately afterwards, and everything immediately falls apart, and then we just jump right to the climax. This is why story structure is important, guys. Like, without it, everything just rings hollow and feels meaningless. And for that matter, why would they ask Noah of all people? Like, we see very quickly that there are warriors who join the rebellion, like Gileon, for instance, and these are people who have experience fighting. They seem like they would be a better choice to lead an armed rebellion, you know? Noah has hunting experience, which, it, I mean, that's not nothing. You could show him being a skilled hunter earlier and then show how uh, he can use that uh, knowledge and experience to be a good battlefield commander or something. You could do something with that, but they don't here. He is not a warrior or a commander. And he's not a scholar or a philosopher, he's not a hero, he's not a champion of God. He is just the main character. Which means he is none of those things, but according to the story, he is all of those things. Also, by this point, it's been almost a hundred pages since Noah's fake death. Like, there, there's so much in this book that is either needlessly long descriptions, villains going, mwahaha, I'm evil, or good guys just kind of existing. Like, I cannot call this boring, even. Because boring would imply that things are happening and they're just not interesting. This is empty because nothing is happening. So the villains are preparing for Zara and Samyaza to get married, d despite her not really wanting to. So, like, she is now officially the sexy lamp that Samyaza and Noah are gonna fight over. You know, like, you could replace her with a sexy lamp and everything in the story would stay exactly the same and make exactly as much sense. Not everyone is happy about the two of them getting married, though. Isla aimed her venom at an easier, absent prey. Well, if father wishes to sow his seed once more, I suppose some country-born coquette is suitable field to plow. He shall do so without my blessing, though. Again, this book just tries so hard to sound epic and poetic, but it just comes across as like a little kid trying to sound cool. So, a lot of time passes, uh, it's a little vague, it could be weeks, months, not really important. So, a, a lot of time passes, 
and Enoch has some gigantic feasts to celebrate the upcoming wedding. I, I assume there's wine. It's not specified, but you can safely say that there's wine. Uh, Noah shows up at one of them, and Zara is really happy about it. She's like, oh my gosh, Noah, you're here. And then he gives this dramatic speech about how the Grigori took the earth from the humans and how their time is over. And y you know the drill, the hero giving a dramatic speech to the villains. It, it, it's fine, you understand. And then Samyaza orders him killed, and some guards look like they're about to do it, but then a bunch of them defect. Like, either they were part of the rebellion to begin with, or Noah just convinced them with his speech. Not really important. They defend Noah, and then they all just leave. Like, they're, they're just allowed to leave. They don't even have to fight their way out and run away or anything. They, they just, they head off. And then outside, an army appears outside the city, and it's under siege now. So this is where the climax begins. So, entirely off screen, Noah gathered an army, who are mostly from Eden, apparently. He built some siege engines, off screen. He gathered weapons, off screen. He organized all of this and came up with a plan, off screen. And now it just shows up and we're supposed to think, oh, that's cool, instead of thinking, oh, that's really unsatisfying because we didn't see him put in any of the work to actually do that, you know? This is, this is the problem with having obnoxious Mary Sue characters. Like, all of this is to make, all of this is happening off screen to make the main character look cool and smart and look like a good leader without putting in any of the actual work to actually make them cool or smart or a good leader. Like, I have not been this unsatisfied at a supposed awesome moment from a protagonist since I read Throne of Glass. See, in Throne of Glass, for those who haven't read it or seen my videos on it, uh, the main character, Aelin, th there's a part where she breaks into a bank vault and replaces a villain's will with a forged one, and then they kill the villain, and when his will is read off, they, like, get all his stuff, right? And so she got the forgery off screen, so the audience doesn't know about it, and then she broke in and replaced it off screen, so the audience doesn't know about it, solely so that it'll be surprising when the reveal happens. So, like, that, that's the problem with the book. It's more concerned with shock than it is with making sense, and that's exactly what happened here in Leviathan. Like, if your protagonist can accurately be compared to Aelin from Throne of Glass in terms of Mary Sunus, something has gone horribly wrong. On top of that, how does Noah know how to build all of this? Like, they have, again, siege engines and stuff, so how does he know how to build all this? How does he know the tactics of siege warfare? How does he know how to organize everybody into formations that will allow them to fight effectively. That's irrelevant, I suppose. Like, I, I can stretch my disbelief a little bit. Like, I can accept he's a quick study. I can accept that he read about some of it in the library. I can accept that he would come up with some ideas on his own. But I can't accept that he invented an entire branch of warfare that, as far as we know, it, it hasn't been around in the world before. And even if it has been around, Noah has no contact with it, so it may as well not exist in the world before this. And, it's like, siege warfare took thousands of years to develop IRL, and it was constantly changing over time. One man can't invent it completely on his own without even any experience. But if you can ignore all of that, this final battle is like the Leviathan fight. It, it's kind of cool, at least at first. You know, they hit the walls, they attack the city, they send in Triceratops to break up defensive formations. Like, oh yeah, you forgot there were dinosaurs here, didn't you? Well, <laughs> the author didn't. They... They use Triceratops and send them in to attack enemy formations. Like, it's very, very brief, but, you know, that's something. Uh, they light a bunch of fires around the city, so it looks like there are more people in the army than there really are. They attack the defenders. Like, you know, it's, it's kind of cool. It's not great by any means, but it's kind of cool. But after a while, there are just, there, there are too many things that don't add up, and so the battle just collapses under the weight of these many, many problems. Like, all the stuff I said earlier about how it doesn't make sense that Noah would know how to lead an army like this and build all these uh, siege engines and come up with these tactics and everything, it, it just doesn't make sense. Uh, at one point it specifically says that the Edenites are not warriors and they would probably do poorly against the defenders, but then they do great anyways. They, like, they just win really easy without too much trouble. Uh, somehow, they built a giant battering ram slash tank thing shaped like a leviathan's head. Like, it's like a big wooden and uh, metal structure on wheels which they can hide under and they push it forward to like the doors of the city and then they uh, 
use like a battering ram to break through, which is a neat idea, but like how did, were they able to build it with such primitive technology? I'm, I'm not totally sure. And then Noah brings up the rear, of course, which like it, it makes sense for the leader to be at the rear. Like you don't want him right at the front where he might get stabbed and killed easily, but like that's fine. But at the same time, everyone treats him like he was at the front and he cut through the battle himself. Like, you can't have it both ways. You, you gotta have one or the other. And, in fact, I don't think Noah ever gives orders in this battle. <laughs> not, that I'm, not that I'm noticing it. Like, there's no point where things go awry, and the plan doesn't quite work out the way it's supposed to, and he has to improvise. Like, everything just goes perfectly. Like, presumably he told them about this plan before the battle started, and then they just do it, and it works great. Like, nobody disobeys orders, the enemy doesn't re react in any uh, unpredicted ways. Like, they just everything goes great because Noah came up with the perfect plan from the beginning. Like any tension and excitement that was in this battle at the beginning is just lost. It's, it's like poking a hole in the bottom of a cup and all the water falls out of it. You know, it just, at first it's fine, you can drink a little bit of it, but eventually it just, it's just all gone. So Noah and Gileon and some others go to fight Samyaza, but they have to spend many pages shit talking each other and hyping themselves up and just stopping in the middle to talk, like, just a lot of talk no jutsu going on here. And then Azaziel shows up after a while, too. Two steps to the side, and Noah interposed himself between Azaziel and Gileon, brandishing his staff with both hands held in front of him. A staff? Azaziel sneered. You wish to be cut in half, dust man? Very well. That's a weird line and a weird insult. Uh, also, like, you shouldn't be that specific, because you're specifying two steps to the side. Like, you shouldn't be that exact most of the time. It's just, it's just bad. But this fight, once it gets going, is, you know, fine. You know, Samyaza and Azaziel are just way too fast, and they dodge all the attacks, they counter everything that enemies throw at them. Like, even the huge, battle-experienced Nephilim just can't touch this guy. Like, the Grigori are way too high above both humans and Nephilim. There's nothing you can do to fight them normally. So how, they, how do they defeat these guys? They do not. Like, just all of a sudden, and I do want to underscore, all of a sudden, this happens completely out of nowhere, the skies open up and they see God hanging out in heaven and a bunch of angels descend. And they don't say anything, but Samyaza and some of the other major Grigori flee, and all the remaining Grigori are stripped of their physical bodies and then their spirits just disappear. So yeah, just a, a literal deus ex machina. Literally, God just came out and saved everybody. Like. The heroes can't save the day, so God does it. Like, the, the only positive I can think of in this part is that the description is kind of cool. You know, the angels are described as being biblically accurate, so, you know, they're like a bunch of flaming wheels and thousands of eyes and just, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's kind of cool. Why do so many Christian books, or even books that are just based on Christian myth, do this? Like, why, why do they just have God come up and save everybody at the last minute? Like, isn't... Isn't a pretty big part of that religion that God's not going to directly come in and save the world like that? Like, he'll bring floods and stuff to help slash hinder you, but he's not going to directly show himself like that? I mean, even, hell, even people like Moses, when Moses was talking to God, he talked to him in the form of a burning bush. You know, he didn't just open up the heavens and you could see him. At least God used to do cool stuff like appearing as a burning bush. Nowadays, his power seems to be relegated to just making his face appear on toast sometimes. At least, I don't know, th this idea that God doesn't directly interfere is like the excuse that most people use for why he doesn't, at least not anymore. But, I don't know, like even, e even if Huffman was going for like some sort of theme here, it's still a very unsatisfying way for the villains to be beaten. Because it means that if God had shown up a little bit earlier, everything would have gone quicker. Like, the characters wouldn't have had to die or struggle at all. Like, if he had done this, like, I don't know, halfway through the book, then the Grigori would just be gone, and the day would just be saved. Like, it cheapens the effort and the sacrifice that the characters made. And it, there are a lot of other books based in Christian myth that do this. Like, Fallen is the first one to come to mind. You know, at the end of that series, God literally just came down and stopped Lucifer from destroying the world and saved everybody. And uh, j the last long book review I did was Angel Fire, and that one avoided that trap. It specifically did not just have God come in and save everybody, and as a result, it was much better. This is part of the problem with creating a mythology ruled by an omnipotent de being. 
Like, you're always going to be wonder, well, if he wants things done, why doesn't he just do it himself? Like, you know, the best way to handle this sort of thing uh, is to say that the deity wants to maintain free will. So, like, he's not going to interfere because that's basically just living the humans' lives for them. Like, uh, if you ever read Mistborn Era 2, which you should, Mistborn Era 1 and Era 2 are both pretty good, uh, there's a sequence where Harmony is talking to Wax, and he explained this, explains this to him. He says, look, if I handle every problem for you, then you're just going to be like pets. You know, I have to let you live your own life, otherwise your own life won't mean anything. And, I mean, that one was also written by Brandon Sanderson, and I think that was, like, his genuine uh, religious beliefs poking through for a second. Because that is a real way that a lot of real religious people approach the subject. They're like, well, if we don't have free will, then there's no point to it. Like, you know, we're supposed to use free will to be good people, but if there's no struggle to be good people, then it's meaningless. You know? Like, that that's a real thing that real people believe. Or maybe you could leave it ambiguous as to whether or not God is real, because, you know, in, in the real world, having faith in God is not about, like, just seeing him in the sky one day. Uh, but if you want to leave it ambiguous, then you could have a message of God helps those who help themselves. Like, uh, I'm thinking of the priest from The Walking Dead, at least the show, who for a long time was just walking around refusing to ever fight or anything other than run away from the zombies, and then he just said, that's okay, God will protect me. And after a while, he realized he, has to, he had to take action himself. Like, he straight up said, God helps those who help themselves. Like, he gives you opportunities, he gives you the tools you need to protect yourself and to come out on top of these difficult situations, but you still have to take action, otherwise it's not going to work out for you. And like I was saying earlier, it seems that Noah was using trust in God as an excuse not to do anything, and this sort of message could be a refutation to that sort of thing. But this clearly shows that Noah was right to not freaking do anything, because you can apparently just sit around and wait for God to handle everything. Like I said, Noah cannot develop or change at all over the course of the story because that would imply that he wasn't perfect to begin with. And that's, that's the problem. Like, yes, obviously the biblical Noah is, as I was saying, a paragon of virtue, but that's just not that interesting to read about. And this is supposed to be like his origin story where he's a young man. We can see him turn into a paragon of virtue instead of just being one. You know, this, this is what I was saying earlier. This book is not bad because it's Christian. It's bad because it's bad. So with the battle over, Noah goes off to rescue Zara, and Lilith is there, and Lilith kills her. Like, did, did I even mention? <laughs> I genuinely don't remember if I even mentioned Lilith being in this book. Like, it, I don't know, it, it doesn't matter. There's so many characters who contribute nothing outside of a single scene, and like, this is Lilith's one scene where she actually does anything. She, she kills Zara. So Noah does fail to save his beloved at the end, and Admittedly, that did surprise me a little bit. You know, it, it saves this from being a completely generic happy ending, at least. Like, it's it, it's not great, but it's something, I guess. Uh, so then they go through the city and massacre everyone who stood against them, and this is portrayed as a good thing, because they're psychopaths, I guess. Uh, when they're done, they drink some more of Methuselah's wine, and now the humans and the Nephilim are in control of the city, and the Grigori are gone. So... Noah stays behind to rebuild while his family goes back to Eden, and as they're walking away, going home, they decide to just stroke him off one last time. Mark my words, my son, Methuselah said to Lamech as they began their long journey home. The world will be changed because of that man. Of that I have no doubt, my father, he laughed. Of that I have no doubt. Okay, if by long journey home they mean like four days, but okay, sure. But. Yeah, again, it's just everyone in the story constantly telling us how amazing Noah is and how he's going to change the world. And that one at least kind of makes sense because at this point he was involved in taking over the city and getting rid of the Grigori, and it is his father and grandfather who are really proud of him. And as far as they're concerned, he's the one, he's the one that like led this and is the mastermind behind all this. So it, it does make some sense that they're saying this at least. It just doesn't make sense from an objective standpoint. So the Grigori who fled, including Samyaza, uh, they all officially join forces with Lucifer because, you know, again, they're, they're evil. Uh, and there is a very short epilogue that takes place 18 years later. Noah is building a tower with some others, and apparently he was the architect of this tower because of course he was. I'm half expecting to find out he's a fucking pilot at this stage. 
But yeah, so much of Enoch was destroyed in the fighting that it's taken them, you know, all this time to rebuild. It's been 18 years. And at the very end, the final leader of the council decides that he's going to rename the city Atlantis. <laughs> and that is the last line of the book. It's... <laughs> like I said, man, that, that was the one line in this book that actually made me laugh. And it was not friendly, good-natured laughter. It was mean-spirited, harsh, like, I, again, if Huffman was here, I would point in his face and fucking laugh at him, because that's the dumbest shit I've ever read. <laughs> or one of the dumbest things, okay. The, the bar's pretty high, but it, it nearly clears that bar. Because you know a story is out of ideas when it brings in random conspiracies and legends just completely out of nowhere. You know, like, if a story just completely out of nowhere brings up the Illuminati, or the lizard people, that's how you know they're out of ideas. Or, hell, remember in Save the Pearls when halfway through it revealed that Aztec gods are a thing, and that some of the main characters were just Aztec gods, which that had never been hinted at before. It's clear that the book was just out of ideas at that stage. Plus, Atlantis was not in the Bible. Atlantis was a myth that originated in the writings of Plato. L like, trying to integrate legends like Atlantis into your religion is some weirdo happy science cult shit. And no, I'm not talking about the Church of Happy Science. We do not have time. Just look it up, trust me. But yeah, that's the note it ends on. Like, this city is Atlantis, and it's trying to leave us in suspense for next time, but it's such a ridiculous thing to say that it kills any and all suspense that might have been there. And, like, that that's the end. It's a, it's a very muted end, considering that there was that huge battle at the climax, but, like, it's just... Yeah, it just ends with such a whimper. It's... It's weird, and you may have noticed that the summary for this book was kind of short in relation to how long this video is, and yeah, it, it is. This book, it's not particularly long, but it's not really short either. Like, you can see it's, it's a mass market paperback, and it's only a little over 400 pages, and that includes, like, the genealogy, and the acknowledgement section, and the bestiary. Like, there, there's just not that much going on here. Like, now, now you know what I meant when I said it was empty. There's a lot of stuff here that could have been unironically great, and there's a lot of stuff here that could have been hilariously stupid, but none of it ever reaches its potential because R.M. Huffman refused to ever make a choice. You know, th think about it. He created a world where dinosaurs are a thing, and other than the Leviathan, he just barely did anything with it. You know, if you're gonna have dinosaurs there, go crazy with it. Have Noah be a dino rider who fights bad guys from the back of a triceratops, you know? Have the villains tame a leviathan and use it to attack the good guys so they have to, so they have to kill it at the end. We have the Grigori in this story, and the, they are evil angels who rule this city. What are their powers, you know? They are really fast. That That's about it. You know, they don't have any crazy magic or anything, so they're not that intriguing or cool as villains, you know? The Edenites, they live right next to the birthplace of humanity, or in the birthplace of humanity. Again, it's kind of confusing. Uh, and they remember the old ways, and they remember God when others have forgotten. What sort of definable culture do these people have? You know, how does this, them remembering the old ways while everyone else has forgotten, how does that affect their relationships with the outside world? It's irrelevant, because they have no relationships with the outside world. Like, all of this stuff that could be neat is just sort of thrown out there and then left alone. You know, you can't expect everyone else who reads your book to already love the characters and the setting and to already to want to know what happens next. Like, you have to do something to make them care. Like, the author just sat back and expected neat things to happen without doing it himself. I wonder if that affects any of the themes of his writing. Look, good stories, at the end of the day, come from making decisions and committing to them. You know, making bold choices. Hilariously bad stories also come from committing to weird choices. Like, Save the Pearls? Th those books are shit. But that series committed to its bold and ridiculous world building about how the main character wants to turn everyone into furries and how white people are legally required to wear blackface when they're in public. Or Tommy Wiseau's acting is very famous, uh, and it's hilarious because he's clearly trying. I mean, what's more entertaining? This? You are tearing me apart, Lisa. Or this? You are tearing me apart, Lisa! Those are both equally bad acting, but one of them makes a very bold choice. And frankly, if Tommy Wiseau didn't have such an odd accent and odd cadence when he speaks, that 
like very big operatic uh, reaction might have worked. But because he doesn't, it was funny. You know, it didn't work, but it's still entertaining. Leviathan just has nothing like that, and so it has nothing here that makes it worth reading. Like, at all. You know? It's not good. It's not funny bad. It's, it's not even really worth hate reading so that you can get mad at, like, ultra-Christian beliefs being pushed, because it doesn't even do very much of that. Like, Huffman gave us an empty glass and told us to drink up, and when he, him and people who agree with him ideologically hear anybody say that, hey, this glass is empty, or, and we don't like that this glass is empty, they're going to claim that, oh, they're only saying that because they hate Christians, or because we're woke, or brainwashed libs, or whatever. Secretly, they actually love it because it's objectively great. Like, they're just going to ignore and dismiss any and all criticisms. Because, let's be honest here, R.M. Huffman is definitely going to watch this video sooner or later. <laughs> he might turn it off after five minutes in a rage, but he's gonna watch at least part of it. This guy has a huge ego, at least when it comes to his writing, and people with big, fragile egos have a whole litany of psychological tools they use to avoid realizing that they have the capacity to do a bad job at literally anything. Like, they, they have a lot of ways to avoid criticizing themselves. And honestly, if there's anything about this book that can be called objectively bad, it's that it has nothing to appeal to anyone. You know, fantasy fans don't get a good fantasy story. Christians do not get anything interesting in regards to their faith. Like, there's... who's this for? I, I don't know. Like, there are a lot of moments in this book that make me think of other books or movies that did something similar, but they did it a lot better. And I think that's what this was, really. Like, the author saw stuff that he thought was cool, but he didn't understand how or why it worked, and then he just threw it in there without doing the necessary legwork to make it work and then he tried to combine it with biblical lore, and that's it. And so because of that, a few things are kind of cool, but that is the highest level this book ever reaches. It is kind of cool sometimes. Now, the problem here is not that the author disagrees with me in terms of religion and politics. When somebody who disagrees with me writes fantasy, we get stuff like The Lord of the Rings, or The Chronicles of Narnia, or A Song of Ice and Fire, The Powder Mage Trilogy, Lightbringer, <laughs> the first couple of Lightbringer books, let's say, and the Cosmere. You know, like, those are all great fantasy, and they were all written by people who are much more religious or politically different than I am. You know, uh, Lord of the Rings and Chronicles of Narnia were written by J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, both of whom were fairly conservative and religious, even by the standards of the time they lived in. Like, if I met them personally, would I get along with them super well? Probably not, but I still really love and appreciate their work. That's when somebody who disagrees with me writes fantasy, though. When somebody who is possessed by ideology to the point where they're incapable of seeing the real world tries to write fantasy, we get crap like Leviathan, and the Fifth Sorceress, and the Sword of Truth, and Shadow of the Conqueror. Actually, you know what? Sword of Truth, it's not fair to put Sword of Truth there, because that's a bad series, or... Okay, I've only read the first book, but the first book was pretty bad, and from what I understand, the rest of the series does not improve. But... It, it, it's not very good, but, and it's obsessed with showing off how cool Terry Goodkind thought libertarianism was, but he at least understood the basics of how to structure a story and give the characters personality. You know, like, J Terry Goodkind was a jerk, but he did sincerely believe in all this, and it was just a reflection of how he saw the world. And that's what art often is. It's a reflection of how you see the world and how you see humanity. And if that's what you make, then by me consuming that art, it allows me to look at things from a new angle, from your perspective, and understand you better and understand the world a little better, even if I disagree with it. Or even if I disagree with your views, I should say. Like, everybody likes Rage Against the Machine's music, and they're a bunch of anarcho-communists. Like, I think a substantial chunk of their audience would probably disagree with them politically, at least in part. But it still works, and people still love them, because their music is a reflection of the world as they see it. They're angry at the state of things, but that anger is rooted in a deep love for humanity, and a sympathy for the suffering of others. But, again, that's just somebody who you may disagree with creating art. If you are actually blinded by the world, again, blinded by ideology, then you can't show anyone things from a different angle, because you're not actually seeing the world from any angle. All you can do is point and yell, but no one else can see what you're pointing at. And that is poison both to yourself and to your art. 
I've said for a while that The Fifth Sorceress is the worst epic fantasy I've ever read, and I, I do stand by that. Like, that one is worse because it evoked many more emotions in me than this, including anger, annoyance, and disgust. But still, I would rather read The Fifth Sorceress again than read this crap again because The Fifth Sorceress had things to say. They were stupid things, they were gross things, but they were things, you know? And it's just, it's so bizarre that Noah, the guy from the Bible who made the Ark, Noah fighting dinosaurs and evil angels, it's so odd that that would be so dull, you know? Like, th there are sequels to this book. It's part of a series, it's called uh, The Antediluvian Legacy, which is not a made-up fantasy word, word, by the way. Antediluvian just means relating to the world before the biblical flood. Uh, but, like, there are sequels. The second book is already out, but I'm not gonna read them. Like, it, it's kind of common for bad book series to have a really boring first book, and then the later ones get really nuts. But this one already had Noah fighting dinosaurs and evil angels, and it was boring as shit. Like, adding Atlantis into the mix isn't going to make it entertaining. Not even ironically. I don't think you can get a whole lot crazier than this, and... It, like, I have it either be good fun or bad fun. Like, it's just going to be throwing out some crazy and then doing nothing with it. I wish I had more to say about this book itself, but I... I, I just I just really don't. It's empty. There's very little here. Like, I can talk about some of the stuff surrounding it still. Like, the publisher, for instance. The publisher is called Brown Books Publishing Group, and it's kind of weird. Like, according to their website and some articles that people wrote about them, what they do is, rather than what most publishers do, where you have to finish up a manuscript and then submit it to them, and if they like it, they'll take it and help you edit it and then send, print it and send it out and sell it, but Brown Books Publishing Group takes unfinished manuscripts. Like, instead of taking completed ones and polishing them, they take incomplete ones, and then the authors will pay them to help them finish. Like, the, the authors pay them for editing, Pay, sometimes they'll pay them for ghostwriting, uh, and they'll pay them for printing, but in exchange they retain the rights to the book, like if they want to sell movie rights or anything, and they retain most of the profits, which is completely backwards from traditional publishers, where they take care of all of that, uh, but in exchange they take the lion's share of the profits. And honestly, that explains a lot about this book, because, like, th this isn't a specifically Christian press, they publish all kinds of stuff, but, like, if this is something where you already pay them, and they've already made their money, then they're just gonna want to take care of business ASAP and throw it out to market. Like, they, they don't make much money whether it sells well or not, so they don't really care if it sells well. Like, so they're not gonna put in that much time or effort into editing it and making it good. Which is the direct opposite of traditional publishers who actually want it to succeed. Like, if you're going to a traditional publisher, like, I'm not saying that traditional publishing doesn't have issues because it has a lot, but like, at the very least, your interests and their interests are aligned most of the time. Brown Books Publishing is also guilty of scamming authors. Like, they, they've done that in the past, so stay away from them, any, everyone. And, it, look, just general advice for, like, publishing or anything else. If somebody wants you to pay them for the privilege of entering to bus into business together, it is a scam. And, I like, like I said, they do offer ghostwriting services. I don't think that Leviathan was ghostwritten. Like, I, I guess it's possible, but I don't think it was. Like, I, I feel like the author deserves both good and bad credit for it. And, I mean, he, again, he's not above taking credit for ChatGPT, even while admitting that he used ChatGPT to write his book. But, I, I mean, I don't think this was ghostwritten. I don't know. This whole thing with Brown Books Publishing is just self-publishing with extra steps. So if you're going to go down that route, you may as well just do self-publishing. Like I mentioned earlier, Huffman has a gigantic ego when it comes to his writing. Like, the only way I found out about this book and then, like, stumbled down the rabbit hole of his derangement uh, is because I just stumbled across a tweet of his where he refers to this, this series as great original fantasy. And he has a few other statements where he says it's, like, way better than any other fantasy coming out nowadays. And he also says similar things about the crappy children's books he's written about farts, you know, where he compared himself to Doctor... Again, he he's written multiple children's books about farts. Like, at that point, I think you just have a kink for it or something. Like, th this man's head is big enough to have its own gravity well. And this is not the first time I've read a book by somebody like him. You know, somebody with 
reactionary political views who thinks that they deserve more success in the artistic world than what they've gotten. You remember a couple of years ago when I reviewed True Allegiance by Ben Shapiro? Like, it's, it's not a great video. It, it had low production value, was kind of clumsy, like I was still figuring out how to do things in this format. I mean, hell, I guess I, I'm still changing and improving, so I guess I'm still figuring out how to do things in this format, but whatever, you understand what I'm saying. And uh, the thing is, Ben Shapiro is known as a political commentator, but before that, he wanted to be a Hollywood screenwriter. And he failed. Like, his parents have Hollywood connections. They worked in Hollywood, but he still couldn't get his screenplays out there. And I haven't read any of them, but I think it's safe to say, based on both his book and the fact that even with connections, he couldn't find anybody to actually buy them and make them into movies, they're probably pretty shit. Now, he was pretty young when he wrote those, I know, and most of us start off as shitty writers. There's no shame in that. Like, I did a video a while ago about the crappy book I wrote when I was 15. You can check that out if you want. It is terrible. It, it just is. We all start off bad at our art, whether it's, you know, writing, music, singing, sculpting, what, painting, whatever. Like, we all start off bad at it, but you get better through practice. And mo moreover, you have to be able to examine your own stuff. You have to find out what works, what doesn't work. Throw out stuff you previously thought was good, because, you know, I'm sure a lot of writers out there can tell you, there's stuff that you think is amazing when you first write it, and then you go back to it like a year later, and you say, oh god, this is terrible. And you have to be able to accept criticism from others. Like, you have to be able to do all of that. And it's a lot of work to not only write something out, but then to go back and realize, okay, large parts of this are just gonna be, have to be gone. And without that, you're not going to get any better at what you're trying to do. And Shapiro and Huffman and others like them, they can't do that. Like, they think that their work is already perfect, and it's society's fault for not uncritically embracing their work. Oh, they didn't buy my screenplays. It wasn't because they were terrible. It's because Hollywood is run by liberals, or wokeness has brainwashed people not to like good art, or, you know, something like that. Just anything to avoid acknowledging that you are imperfect. Because introspection is death to narcissism. On top of that, Shapiro came from a very well-off family and never had to work that hard for anything. Like, it was all handed to him. And I, I don't know about Huffman, but I know a lot of other people in similar situations had the same thing. They came from wealth, but they still uh, screwed up. They still couldn't make it. Because you have to work a lot to get better at things. Like, you have to work a lot to get better at your art. But people like Shapiro just don't want to. So him and Huffman both leaned into reactionary politics. You know, they made a name for themselves as people who tell their audience what they want to hear, and then they just use that as a springboard to get their crappy art out there. And they're not the only ones that have done this, a lot of others have. Like, uh, if you've heard of other political commentators, like Steven Crowder, he was a failed comedian and a failed husband who turned into a political commentator, and sometimes he still pretends to be a comedian because he tells very unfunny jokes that don't have a punchline. A couple of months ago, some people probably became more familiar with Michael Knowles because he made a speech at CPAC where he straight up called for a genocide of transgender people. And he was a failed actor. He followed the same path. Like, he tried to make it as an actor. He couldn't make it as an actor. He didn't want to work hard and get better at it. So he just decided to blame everybody else. And there's also an entire genre of shit rappers that have followed the exact same path. You know, tried to make it as rappers, sucked at it, then just decided, okay, I'll cultivate an audience by blaming the Jews or <laughs> blaming wokeness or whatever for everybody's problems, and then I'll just throw my music out there and then some of them will listen to it. You know, people like Zuby and Tom McDonald. Now, not a single one of these people has achieved their dream. Like, none of them have, have succeeded at it. Like, despite coming from wealthy backgrounds and being given every opportunity to, opportunity to succeed, they failed to reach their dreams. Like, they have an audience of people who will pretend to like whatever they make because it's like owning the libs or whatever, but there is almost no one out there who genuinely liked True Allegiance or who genuinely likes Zuby's music or anything like that. And if you don't believe me, you can just look at the views on their music videos or the number of ratings that their books get on Amazon and Goodreads. Like, their audience just isn't interested in the stuff they have to produce. Their audience is interested in being told that their beliefs are true and hearing about political stuff. Like, they just do not care outside of that. But in their bubble, people like Huffman and Shapiro get to pretend that they succeeded. And they make money, too. Like, there is a lot of money in being a reactionary grifter, but you don't make much money from selling your books or music or 
being an actor or anything else. Because out in the real world, outside of their bubble, their stuff wasn't very good. Like, they couldn't find mainstream success, and they couldn't find success in a niche audience either. But they could get people to fawn over them because of political tribalism. You know, like, just me criticizing them in this way is going to have people coming out of the woodwork saying, actually, it's good, you only hate it because they disagree with you, even though I've specifically said multiple times, no, that's not the problem, and gone over all of the real problems. And for every one of these people you hear about, there are a hundred more out there that you will never see. People who get a few thousand followers on Instagram or Twitter or something because they're crying about how the woke Mario movie is destroying their childhood, or sorry, they're crying about how great the Mario movie is and how it's sticking it to the libs or something. Which one is it again? I don't know. They, they kept going back and forth on that one. They should, they should get their messaging a little better. But they managed to get a few thousand followers by complaining about stupid shit like that. They convince people, hey, I'm on your side and you have to defend me, otherwise the other people will win. And then they like self-publish books on Amazon or some shit like that. And then they sell almost nothing. Their own audience doesn't like what they make. Like I said, Leviathan has 25 ratings on Goodreads and one of those is mine. So even in its niche, it hasn't gotten much traction. Like Christian fiction is a big market. There are plenty of people who would clamor for this sort of story if it was worth reading. And it's just, it's just not. And one day, all of these people, Huffman, Zuby, Shapiro, all of them, one day they will all die. And they will be just as far away from attaining their dreams as they were when they started. And if they have any self-awareness, they're gonna look back and wonder where it went wrong. The moral of this story is that you have to kill your ego or your ego will kill your dreams. Your ego gets in the way of self-improvement, and it gets in the way of your success. There's not a conspiracy to keep conservatives out of the entertainment industry. Most of them are just fragile and unimaginative. It really is that simple. Like, the, the ones that aren't fragile and unimaginative are doing okay for themselves. You know, I, I mentioned before that uh, the Starfire series is great military sci-fi, even though uh, both the writer's political beliefs and the messages being pushed by the books are things I vehemently disagree with. You know, Clint Eastwood and Kelsey Grammer and some others are, like, working in Hollywood. They have pretty good careers, and they're also, like, very right-wing guys. But people don't care because they're actually good at what they do. Richard Mark Huffman is not unique by any means, even though on the surface he sounds like kind of an interesting person. Again, he's, he's a Russian propagandist. He's an author. He writes both adult and children's books. He's a doctor. Like, he, he sounds like an interesting person, but he's just following the same pattern a thousand other people already have, and he's not doing it very well. Which is why I don't want to read the sequels, even though I normally would in this situation. Like, the Leviathan is an empty derivative book, and it is written by an empty derivative man. I already know everything about them that I need to know from the first one. So now for some news, by which I mean, let's talk about my next super long review, which will be out in a couple of months, because I did two really close together. I did Angel Fire and then this really close together, and that's very tiring, so I need to take a bit of a break before I do that. And also this and Angel Fire were both based on Christian myths, so I need to take a bit of a break from anything based on that. So I asked in a short, just a couple of days before filming this, what you people wanted me to review next, and you answered, so stay tuned for Breathe by Sarah Croson. It is, it's about a world where there's no more oxygen, and so everybody lives under domes and they have to pay for air, which, that's just an edgy version of the Lorax movie. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous, but you know, I'll see you when that comes out, probably sometime this summer. Goodbye. Wow, you, you're still watching? I. I mean, I guess I appreciate it, but I'm not sure why. I mean, at this point, all that we have left is all these names here. These are my patrons, and including my $10 and up patrons. Apo Savalainen, Olivia Rayan, Brother Santodes, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dawn, Dio, Echo, Flax, Karkat Kitsune, Lexi Delorme, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Micaphone, Mistboy, Peep the Toad, Roby Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Ve Victus, and Wesley. These are all great people, you know? Let me, let me just, let me tell you. If you want to get your name on here, then consider 
donating to me once a month, become a patron, or if you don't feel like doing that, or you just can't because, you know, you're like poor or whatever, no shame in that, uh, then just, you know, rate the video, comment on it, subscribe, share it around, spam it to all your friends, and uh, yeah, goodbye.